Thank you, Hal, and uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, and I'd like to also welcome our friends from America. Thank you and good evening to you over there. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a quick bit of um, housekeeping. I'm reasonably militant on things like bios and that sort of thing, so I'm not going to read out lots of bios. All that information is on the app um, and on our website, and it only eats into time that you're going to um, use to hear from our experts that we've put together for this particular session. Um, this first panel will focus on viewpoints from North America, and we've invited an excellent diverse panel to share their insight and opinions. Um, and included on the panel are Caroline Winnett from uh, Barclay Skydeck, Kirk Zeller from Silicon Prairie Center, Juan Arango from Keretsu Forum, Eric Chen from OVO Fund, and their moderator uh, this evening for them, and this morning for us, is Mark Radcliffe, who's a partner at DLA Piper. And with that, I'll hand over to Mark for a good session. Thank you very much, and hello to everyone in Japan. Uh, we look forward to having a vigorous discussion here. We are, uh, we've structured this as a conversation among the panelists. We encourage the audience to participate, so if you have questions, please ask those questions uh, during the discussion. The way we've set it up is we're going to, I'm going to give a brief overview of the uh, current state of the venture industry, particularly CBC in Silicon Valley and uh, globally. Uh, we're then, then going to have the panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to go to questions. And once again, the questions are meant to encourage uh, discussion among the panel and the audience. Uh, briefly, I'm a partner of DLA Piper in Silicon Valley. DLA Piper is a global law firm. All this information is on the app. But we have offices in over 42 uh, countries. I lead our uh, corporate venture capital practice, which is the largest in the world, and I've been doing it since 2001. I'm also quite familiar with Japan, having served on uh, as the private sector co-chair for US-Japan um, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Council about five years ago. So what I want to talk about now is the current state of the venture ecosystem. And there is a presentation on your app, which you can take a look at. I'm going to draw out just a couple of points here. I'm not going to go through the entire PowerPoint. I think the critical uh, thing for people to understand is um, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've never seen so much money in the ecosystem. So money really is now a commodity, which, and so you have to differentiate yourself in some other way. Simply being able to write a check doesn't, it's not very meaningful for the best startups and even for the common, common run of startups. And that's frankly where corporate VCs have a great advantage because they bring a lot more to the table than simply money. Uh, just to put some numbers around that last year, according to the um, pitch book, uh, National Venture Capital Association survey, there was $130 billion invested in startups. In the US, there's already over 8,400 deals. There are now over 1,600 corporations who've done at least one deal um, in the last year. And so they are, so obviously corporates are much more active than they used to be. Um, when I started back in 2001, there were really only about nine corporate VCs. Now, as I said, there's 1,600. But I think one thing that's critical and that we'll address as we go along is uh, different corporate venture funds can have different goals. Um, I tend to, uh, to put them into four different categories. One is what I call look around the corner. That's what um, Arvind Sodhani used to describe as Intel's philosophy when he ran Intel Capital. And the idea was we're not trying to generate revenues in the next year or two years or even three years. We're trying to help our business units understand what's going to happen five to 10 years out. The second one is to increase near-term revenue. So you want to do a deal with somebody who uh, focuses in your area where there's going to be an immediate commercial effect. Um, the third is what I call try before you buy, where you're basically taking a look at the company and trying to decide whether at some point in the future you're going to acquire it. And then another one is trying to identify um, new markets or ecosystems, because as we move forward, I think what we're seeing is an increase in the number of markets which are dominated by ecosystems and platforms. Blockchain's an example of that with Ethereum 
being the best known platform, but with other platforms like Hedera Hashgraph and the, um, as well as EOS and Algorand and Avalanche. So there are a lot of different opportunities there, but those platforms, just like the Linux platform in the operating system market have become critical. And so that's yet another strategy. So without further ado, what I'm gonna do is turn it over to our panelists and I'm gonna ask Kirk who's sitting next to me to sort of describe <laughs> what he does and then we'll go through the rest of our panel. So I'm Kirk Zeller, I'm founder of the Silicon Prairie Center, which is an entrepreneur, which is a unique entrepreneur live and work community. We have three buildings with residences, office space and, uh, and lab space as well. Um, we're incubating a couple of companies in there right now. We also use it as back office for, um, uh, for some of the other businesses that I've started. And that ties in in that we do some outsourced sort of corporate venture work uh, for some of the large, uh, large strategic. So I often find myself on kind of both sides of the corporate venture equation, uh, now representing one of, uh, one of our early stage startups that's engaging with, uh, with some of the corporate VCs. Carolyn, can you give it a, us your background, please? Sure, I'm Caroline Wynette. I am the executive director of Berkeley Skydeck. We are UC Berkeley's campus startup accelerator and incubator. We have currently 145 startups in our program, so we're quite a large program. We draw from uh, not just Berkeley campus, but from all the UC campuses, all the 10 campuses. And we also accept startups into our accelerator track who are located outside the US looking to come launch their companies here in Silicon Valley. We are a campus program, so we connect directly to faculty, staff, alumni, um, the huge alumni network uh, of, that is Berkeley. And we have a dedicated venture fund, a private venture fund, the Berkeley Skydeck Fund, that invests in all of the startups in our accelerator track and shares half of fund carry with campus. So that's a quick synopsis of what we do here at Berkeley Skydeck. Thank you. Juan, can you tell us about uh, Karitsu Forum? Are Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Kretsu Forum is an angel organization, um, one of the largest, if not the largest, in the world. We have 55 chapters in three continents. We have over 3,000 angel investors that uh, actively look for deals and fund deals. Uh, we're founded in 2000, and over the years, we have uh, funded close to 1,100 companies uh, for uh, around $800 million. Um, yeah, our strength is due diligence and we syndicate deals all over the world. We specialize, especially in early stage startups. And Juan, I think that you have, as I understand, you have different chapters in different geographies, is that correct? Correct. Um, the one that I am entrepreneur director, due diligence director and syndication director for is the Pacific Northwest. We have uh, six chapters up here. Uh, around 330 investors and last year to give you guys a sense of scale just our group invested 54 million dollars in the in the 78 companies um, an interesting fact is that um, we invest in approximately 70 percent of the companies that come through our process and it's structured our purpose is actually to fund good companies thank you that's what we do eric Yeah, thanks, Mark. So um, OVO Fund is a traditional um, venture fund. It's a $35 million vehicle. We invest into pre-seed startups, um, typically pre-revenue, certainly pre-revenue, certainly pre -revenue, pre customer sometimes even pre-product. Um, we're in the first round of funding, usually with other friends and family and angel investors, so it's pretty early. Uh, we've recently started to incubate some of our own companies with um, for solo and first-time founders. Um, we tie pretty closely in with Stanford as well as Berkeley, MIT, especially in the, the business schools and the research labs. Um, the, uh, I mean, we're sort of generally sector agnostic given our strategy. We have a strong preference for capital efficiency. Um, so in practice, we end up in a lot of uh, consumer enterprise software companies. Um, yeah, that's it. Great, thanks. Well, actually that leads into our next question, which is 
Um, how do you find potential firms to invest in it? I've asked Eric to take the lead on that, but I also want the other uh, folks on the, the other panelists to chime in afterwards. Yeah, so let me, I think, let me touch on, uh, I'll touch on sort of funnel process to, just to give some metrics and I'll, I'll do quickly sort of how we evaluate. Um, Cause I think you can answer that question a couple of different ways. Um, so like last year, we tracked this pretty closely. We screen about 500 companies out of our networks of which we end up meeting with about 200 of them. So we do about 500 phone calls or Zoom calls um, about, and then 200 of them will graduate to face-to-face -face meetings. 50 will, will move into diligence. We make offers on 15 and we'll average about 10 investments a year. So that's, that gives you a sense of kind of our, um, our pace. Um, since we're sector agnostic, our evaluation criteria kind of depends on the sector, but in general, we spend probably 90% of our diligence process uh, specifically on, on team related characteristics and attributes. Um, surprisingly, mostly around soft factors like you know, resiliency, resourcefulness, um, sort of the, uh, the integrity uh, of the founders, and then re really their ability to attract and recruit um, a, high, a high potential team. Um, the second area, so after team, which is the majority of it, the second one is that the opportunity has to be big enough. So for us, that means basically in the ballpark of about 100 million in revenue. At some point, the company within our investment horizon, the company has to have the opportunity to get to about 100 million in sales, because um, we think that's a that's a venture type return. And then um, on the product side, we have to have conviction in the product thesis, um, which means a lot of different things depending on the sector. And then finally, the last point for us, which is really important, is that you know we we have to believe that the company can get to product market fit um, in in a capital efficient way, which in other words, like we have to believe the founders and the, the founding team can build something useful uh, that's valuable to a, a customer or show, show demonstrate attraction if it's a consumer product, um, basically within 18 to 24 months of funding. That's kind of the, um, the benchmark for us. And actually there's an old uh, Silicon Valley cliche that reflects this, which is investors bet on jockeys, not on horses. So it's not, it's not the technology, it's the team. So, yeah. Thank you. I think that's absolutely true. So Kirk, maybe you want to go next. Yeah, I'm just going to build on that, that comment you just made. So for the research for my master's, I did it on the financing of medical device companies, interviewed a lot of people, and the number one thing that came down is exactly what you said, the management team. Uh, so I think that's a really good point. So we do... Um, you know, some work for a couple of large uh, strategics. And the way we, we generally approach it is I'll have, uh, you know, get the objectives from the companies. We'll have, um, we'll have the team do some desktop research. And then after 26 years in the industry and going to these conferences and having done this, a lot of times it really comes down to, to leveraging the network, going out and meeting with people, looking up the team on LinkedIn um, and kind of paring things down that way. I'm sure everybody probably uses a very, very similar process and then going to targeted meetings, depending on the, you know, the types of uh, technologies that we're looking for that the industry conferences like AdvaMed's uh, MedTech week that's going on this, this week right now, or if that's a, uh, you know, uh, academic meetings, uh, neurosurgery conferences, et cetera. So Juan, maybe you could give us some insight into how Crutch is going. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in Crutch Forum, we, we operate independently in every region. Our processes are, are pretty, are very similar. Some regions have a little more staff than others, but in general terms, um, we end up looking at 30 to 50 deals a month, which uh, arrive via referral or we go to conferences or they're syndicated by, by our sister angel groups. Out of these 30 to 50 companies every month, we choose uh, between six and 10 companies that come to our deal screening. In our deal screening, we have a group of, of our uh, most active investors. It's a room with probably 20 to 30 investors, and it's uh, basically a seven minute pitch, which qualifies the company. If the company really likes our group, and our group really likes the company, after a vote, Several of, them, several of them are invited, between two and four normally are invited, and they're invited to our forums. 
in our forums, uh, we have here in the Pacific Northwest, we have five chapters that are active. Um, entrepreneurs are, are prepped very well because we want them to present well. They're um, coached on the process. They're pitch coached. And then they come and present during the presentations. Um, they, they talk to 200 to 250 potential investors. Investors actually sign up on their on their interest sheets, so to speak, and um, entrepreneurs recruit. Actually, they recruit our investors for the due diligence process. So our, our thesis is that if an accredited investor is deploying capital and they like a company, well, they're going to want to research it. If they research it, it's a one-on-one -on -one time between the company and the, and the due diligence team, which generates initial investment. And then the rest is communication and uh, coaching them on how to raise more money from investors. So basically how we invest is 100% driven by our investors' interests who invest individually and independently. So, Carolyn, uh, could you add to that the accelerator? That's probably a little bit of a different um, criteria, but perhaps you could uh, give us a sense of how you would, I guess, admit people to the accelerator. Sure. Um, so, like any seed stage investor, um, we're looking for that, that amazing team of jockeys that are running on a gigantic field. So, um, very similar uh, to all approaches. What what, uh, in terms of numbers, what we go through here, we have two cohorts, we have a six month cohort, so we do this twice a year. And every six months, um, the application number keeps climbing. The last one was about 800, of which we choose about 20 for the accelerator track. So that's highly competitive. Um, there's a, uh, also a set that are chosen for incubation track, a little less competitive. Um, and the process is, is quite extensive because we accept all industries. And as you can imagine, the software diligence is different from the biotech di diligence. And in fact, the, the criteria that go into evaluating those different types of companies is very, very, very different. So we have about 60 people who are part of a selection committee, about 40 to 50 are general uh, startup expertise and the other 20 are biotech specifically focused. And um, because we have any industry coming to Skydeck, we have at our disposal Berkeley faculty, students, alumni, if we need particular industry expertise, which we often do. We also accept chip companies. So we've got a really wide variety of technologies. And, you know, as I mentioned, and as we've heard before, we're looking for a founder who will not quit no matter what comes in front of them. Um, and we'll keep going until they succeed, whatever pivots may come. Um, and what looks like an interesting market. And because we're with them for six months, we have a lot of opportunity to coach them, to train them, to make introductions. And what we're looking for in the accelerator track is that at the end of those six months, <coughs> we're going to present at our demo day uh, and be re ready to raise an institutional round with accredited investors. And do they have to have a connection to Berkeley or any other UC campus or? So to get into the accelerator track, they must have a either a UC connection, so that's any of the 10 campuses or any of the national labs, um, or they can be <coughs> located outside the US. And what we look for are companies who have demonstrated real strength in their home markets, either through their technology or scientific developments, or through building a product that obviously has some pull from the customer. Um, and then the filter that they come through is, are they looking to connect with Berkeley? Are they looking for faculty to be advisors? Are they, are they looking for students or alumni here to be co-founders? Um, and we filter for that because our mission is to bring talented founders to Berkeley to add to the incredible ecosystem here and to support the founders who are already here at Berkeley with global talent to help them build their own companies. Thank you very much. Well, that sort of leads into my next question, which is, as corporate VCs out in the audience, how can they best interact with an accelerator like Skydeck? 
Sure. So um, a couple of ways. We have a formal program of partnership, which is great. It helps fund our program. Uh, and that's for companies who really want to really engage. They want to spend time here. They want to be involved in the admissions process. They want to um, connect with Berkeley faculty. They want us to really show them what's going on here at Berkeley in a very curated way. Um, so that's a formal partnership that, that we have folks join, companies from all over the world join that. Uh, and then we, of course, are looking for companies that are looking for cool startups. Those are always welcome here. So if you're a corporate and you'd like to invest in startups or meet startups and do any one of those things you mentioned, you know, look around the corner or, or, uh, or drop some dollars uh, in term sheets, um, we, of course, welcome investors that way. And um, corporates are welcome to um, come to our, our formal demo day because they're, of course, looking to invest. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Juan, could you describe how Koretsu Forum interacts with corporates? Absolutely. Um, so right now, uh, Koretsu Forum, well, Koretsu Forum has always been more in the, in the uh, retail angel space, right, as an angel group. Um, now we are also part of a family office association, family office network. So we're bringing in a little bit more money and we are starting to connect in a serious way with, with CVCs. Um, what I often find and what we often find after looking at the, at the results of every meeting is that there is large, large appetite in the family office community and in the CVCs that attend our events in the type of startups that we have. Despite the fact that they're, you know, they're early stage, you know, they're, they may be a couple million into, into revenue, the, the big ones, five million into revenue. Um, a very good way to engage for a CVC is to attend angel meetings, talk to, talk to the entrepreneurs, and since we normally do not have this type of accelerator structure, maybe CVCs might be interested in engaging as advisors or making small um, investments into the most interesting startups. That works, that works um, in, in two very positive ways. Number one, it gives startups the traction they need to attract more investment. And from the CVC's point of view, they get very early access to technology that eventually will, you know, will pay off for a minimum price. So join boards, invest a couple dollars into startups, attend every single event. There's something really interesting happening out, happening out there in early stage. Okay, that's helpful. Eric, maybe you want to talk about how OVO Fund interacts with corporates? Yeah, sure. So I think at the core of what we do is I think it's um, it's mostly around community building. So, you know, early stage funds like like ours, you know, we're, we're always constantly building community around our founders, co-investors, um, advisors, potential customers, channel partners, um, and then maybe even potential acquirers. So it's about sort of engaging in that community. And um, a lot of that, a lot of tactically, a lot of that is participating in events that we try and you know, small that we try and um, throw for on behalf of our portfolio companies and the founder community, which is typically manifests itself in small group dinners. Um, so I think that's one thing is just sort of being active in the um, in the community. There is, um, and then obviously I think some some of the stuff that Juan was talking about as well. You know, the follow on, the um, participating as investors, um, strategic um, value add is obviously very useful. One of the things that we've been trying to push though. Um, a little bit is, which I think is a little bit more tangible. Um, it's a more tangible way of getting, um, developing a tight relationship with the early stage community is, you know, getting involved even at an earlier stage. So we do know, um, what I mean is, we do know um, a few forward thinking corporate VCs who are, um, who are engaging almost at the uh, founding stage as sort of, um, customer development partners. So they're, they're helping navigate the big um, company, a big enterprise and helping them with customer development type work, which I think, or cu customer discovery work, which I think is particularly useful for an early stage startup. 
um, or things like, and it's not about the funding, it's really just um, helping them navigate through that organization, whether it's customer feedback, potential customer feedback, or even in the case of healthcare, for example, um, trying to provide uh, patient data in exchange for uh, a role to be played in, in founding a startup. So I think like there are, there are more creative ways where I think you can really deepen a relationship with um, the startup community and the founder community. Thank you very much. Kurt, maybe you want to address that. Yeah, again. I think, you know, from the perspective of corporate VC, if you want to be uh, competitive with the other potential funding sources, I think you need to show how you can add value. Um, you know, yeah, whether that be leveraging the expertise of some of your experts, uh, leveraging some of the infrastructure and facilities that you have. So I think, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of money out there right now. And so it's probably an era where maybe you know, the, uh, the entrepreneurs can be a little bit more selective. So I think, you know, they're going to be looking for, you know, how can they help us? And if it's just purely money, they may look beyond and, and look at other options. Well, actually, that leads to the next question, uh, Kirk, and you're going to take the lead on this one, which is how do you advise your companies about the different options as far as investors go? I think that, that is right at the core of it. Um, you know, be, whether you're talking about angels or corporate VCs or you know, traditional venture capital, uh, I advise the companies on what are you going to get out of this beyond the money? Um, and starting with, with angel investment, you know, in, in the field that I'm in, a lot of uh, startups immediately jump to, hey, let's go out and get a bunch of doctors as uh, potential investors, which on the surface seems like a great idea. But if you go out and you get money from 20 different experts, those experts um, all are going to have opinions, and those opinions at times may differ. And you're going to find, I think, in many cases, you find yourself in a very difficult situation. You know, if you've got to listen to one split group of uh, experts versus another, it's a little bit easier when you're dealing with professional investors and you can reference, uh, you know, some experts. So, you know, that's that's uh, one of the things that I think you know people oftentimes um, you know get challenged with on the angel side. But on, on, the, on the corporate side and on the VC side is really what, you know, what other value? As I mentioned, you know, do they have some synergistic uh, expertise to, that, they can, that they can bring to the table to, to kind of help you uh, advance your goals? Um, and if it, you know, if it comes down to it and it's purely money, then as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of startups are going to probably look to who can add value just beyond writing a check. And so Juan, how would, how would you respond to that question about you know, the options for your companies. So. Okay, so uh, basically we take um, a very personalized approach on how we advise startups. Uh, like I said, since we, you know, since we play in the retail angel space and we have 300 of them right here in our, in our backyard, um, it's more uh, for the angels, it's more creating, you know, advising companies on how to communicate to create um, that kind of rapport and that type of, of tight relationship that's needed for somebody to actually write you a fifty to thousand, a hundred thousand dollar check. So this is in the angel space. That said, once you go through angels a little bit and you you filled your 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 Series A. You know, accepting fifty thousand dollar, hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar checks definitely clutters your cap table. Like Derek said, you don't want you don't want fifty angels. You don't want fifty angels. Then you start looking for institutional, well, you know, higher up money, like family offices. Family offices are a little bit different, despite the fact that they're also human, and these same communication strategies work with them. Um, an idea that I tell my that I tell my um, my entrepreneurs is, you know, it takes the same amount of time to convince somebody to give you a twenty five thousand dollar check, than somebody to give you a five hundred thousand dollar check. It's exactly the same time. You meet with them the same times. They have the same concerns. So once it's time, they definitely should should look for that for that higher for that higher um, set of investors. One thing particular that we've, that we've noticed and we know about, um, about family offices is that once you're in with one, syndication among family offices is a lot faster, is definitely a lot faster. 
it takes a long time to get 10 accredited investors, you know, angels on board. It takes less time to get five family offices on board. Finally, on the side of, of, of CVCs, well, you know, you guys have seen this. Entrepreneurs say, yeah, and if we capture 5% of the market, Google is gonna buy us. And uh, Microsoft is gonna be so happy, all this stuff, yeah, right. Okay, the idea is to bring down those expectations and I always ask them, are you already talking to potential acquirers? Which strategic do you have on your board? Do you have anybody from that company that's investing, I don't know, five, 10, $15,000, it doesn't matter, as long as he's on your cap table, who is it? So angels, go and network, family offices, get syndicated, CVCs, bring them as early as possible. So Juan, I'm not sure that everybody in Japan understands what a family office is. Could you just give a brief description of that? Absolutely. So a family office is a pool of money that comes from the, you know, the, the main business of a family that is over a hundred million dollars. It's a $100 million pool or bigger um, that gets invested in many, many, many different asset classes. One of which is, um, you know, is, is venture capital, which is actually a small part of what they invest in. Does that make sense? Is that, yeah, was I, I able to capture it? I think that the critical point here is these are very, very wealthy families, billionaires, stuff like that, that have groups that invest their money. And as you said, one of the asset classes now is venture capital. And I think that wasn't the case even five years ago, because the mostly what the, the family office would do is they invest in a venture capital fund. Now they're doing direct investment. So I think that's, yeah. that is a change that we've seen recently. So, so Carol, maybe you. you could answer, maybe you could answer that question for us. <laughs> Um, I think between different types of investors. So. Yeah, so <clears throat> startups still all want, want to receive the almighty check. Um, and what we coach them on is that, um, you know, as we've heard said already, that the quality of the dollar is extremely important. And um, we remind them because it, it's not that obvious that the relationship you're going to have with your investor is uh, quite intimate. Uh, and it can be a huge benefit to your company and it can be a daily disaster for you if it's the wrong investor. Um, everything from just a person who you can't stand talking to, um, which we see from time to time, not that often, time to time, or um, somebody who's just really at odds with your business strategy. Um, somebody said earlier it takes the same amount of time to raise $25,000 as, as, you know, I would say 2.5 million um, and, and there's some sort of inverse law of the smaller the check, um, the, the bigger the requirement. I'm not sure that's always true, but when it does happen, it's incredibly irritating. Um, I think a lot can be done to help a startup have a successful relationship with an investor um, and have them approach it with a mindset of, first of all, the investor needs you as much as you need them right, without good startups, an investor has nobody to invest in, um, and that your time is just as valuable. In fact, if you're a startup, your time and your equity are the two most valuable things that you have, and the two things over which you have 100% control. You can't, con you have 100% control out over anything else except your time and your equity. Um, so, so be very, very careful with it. And in terms of corporates versus angels versus, um, you know, later stage investors, I think, you know, limiting it just to, to the seed stage and not talking about series A because things get very different then. Um, some of the same things apply, you know, find somebody who can provide some expertise to you um, in addition to a dollar. I think uh, corporates, uh, unlike other investors, small startups will sometimes ask us, you know, is this big corporate going to steal my idea or steal my IP? Do I have to be wary about them? Um, and the answer is, 
be as wary about them as you would be about anybody with whom you're sharing your intimate company details. Um, uh, there are occasional rumors of, of corporates who, um, who are not playing in good faith. I think it's very rare. Um, I haven't seen anything where a corporate has really done something that's underhanded. And in the investment community, your reputation is everything. And it only takes that to happen once or twice, the word gets out and people stop talking to you. Um, so yeah, and I, that, that's an excellent point that I really want to drive home because I think even though there's a lot of money flowing to the system, it still remains a relatively small system. Mm -hmm. And I actually had an experience exactly what you're talking about with actually a Japanese corporate investor who put a term sheet in when the time came to close said, well, we're going to report to reorg, we've got to wait. Can you give us another 30 days? The other investors put their money in. And then they said, no, the term sheet is non-binding, so we're not going to invest. Um, this is a very well-known Japanese corporation. I won't name them. Um, but I said, and I talked to them about it, I said, I don't think this is a good idea. And I think that you're going to find it difficult to get a deal. They couldn't get into a deal for another. They came to me nine months later and said, we haven't been able to get into another deal. And so so think, yeah, investors need to know that we all keep a list. It's not yeah. very long, very short. But on those lists are names of investors who we um, do not recommend. Yeah. There's not just corporates, by the way. There are other. Yeah. Yes. Very, very good point. It investors is have their own, you know, foibles. So right. Know. Eric, maybe you want to talk about that. How do you advise your um, portfolio companies about, you know, which type of investor to take? Yeah. I mean, I think it um, it certainly depends on the round of funding. So I do think. Um, you know, the, you know, a, a company running out of money, trying to do a bridge, that dynamic is obviously going to be very different than um, a well-performing company trying to raise series A. But I think in general, I do think um, the, there's a couple of things. One is, I think it's important to understand who the lead investor is versus who's just piling in. So typically what we tell our, our, um, our founders is, you know, find the lead investor. Everything else is sort of secondary. So someone who can, a lead investor is someone who can sort of set terms, um, be the, typically the largest investor in that round, and then um, and sort of drive that round. So I think everything else is sort of secondary. The, um, the other thing is I think the fit and the chemistry, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is really important. Like, the, like getting an investor on board is sort of a long-term, um, it's a commitment, it's a relationship that has to work out. And it's often not the um, it's not the fund that you're you're um, you're tying up with. It's the fund. So it's the partner at a specific firm that's going to be on your board um, versus the fund. And that chemistry has to be there because it's it's. I mean it's it's. I mean unlike a marriage, you can't get divorced when you take on an investor. So it's very challenging to get a grumpy investor off the board. Um, and then I think. Uh, beyond that, I think it is this question of sort of how do you form your investor syndicate so that you have a balance of um, value add capability. So some inve some investors in a round might like the lead investor might be very good at giving advice on corporate governance and uh, serving on the board and just general business you know growth advice. But another uh, investor in that synd syndicate may have extraordinary industry contacts that can open doors. So I think you want to have an ideal case, uh, a balance. Um, but again, depending on the situation, you know, I think uh, for us, certainly it's the chemistry with the investor. And then the other thing I would emphasize too is in a lot of cases, it comes down to speed. I tell a lot of uh, founders that unfortunately for a lot of these rounds, um, you, the founder is better off closing the round quickly uh, versus optimizing for the perfect syndicate. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think one of the critical points, I think, is to recognize that the average time to exit has gone from five or six years, I think in the 90s and early 2000s, to now it's 10 years. So you're, whoever the startup is working with, they're going to be working with for 10 years. So that's a very long period of time. And I think that's uh, an example of what you were talking about, that you, there has to be a good personal chemistry there uh, for that to work. So actually, Eric, the next question is yours, which is, so how do corporates um, 
interact with traditional venture investors like yourself? How do they make those connections? Yeah. Yes, I think, you know, I think uh, I mentioned it earlier around um, involving yourself in the community, but I think like in general, you know, our, our business is around deal flow. So that's sort of the currency for us. And I think, uh, an important thing that we missed that corporates can really help with is these secular trends, these macro market trends, and engaging in um, you know initiatives that uh, corporates know more about than than we can find in a, reading a 10K or um, on LinkedIn or something. So I think you know I think those types engaging in those types of activities where you're helping us sort of understand these trends is super important on the deal uh, that result in deal flow. So you know a particular um, initiative at a company that we should pay attention to would be super useful for us. So those types of activities. And then I think it's things like, um, you know, uh, helping us in certain, um, thematically in certain portfolio companies, helping us navigate the customer and partnership opportunities within the firms are super useful. Um, and then obviously the, the, um, the, the follow on financing. But one of the things I did want to mention, as I, as I said earlier, is this sort of, I do think there's an opportunity for corporate VCs to engage earlier than they typically do. So even at the, uh, cause I know it's a little bit scary when it's two, um, two guys or two gals in a garage with an idea. Um, but I think like it doesn't, it's not about the funding at that point. It's really just the engagement and helping them get customer feedback. That's so important. This customer discovery process I think is really useful. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point. I would say having worked with corporate for a long time, there is a danger to investing too early because when you invest in a company very long, you don't really don't know what its business is going to be. And, you know, the famous word in Silicon Valley is pivot, which is a fancy way of saying, whoops, wrong market, <laughs> don't have broader market fit. I need to go in a different direction. And that direction can be pretty radically different. So I think from a corporate point of view, um, engagement early on, particularly on the commercial side is, is really a smart idea because there are a lot of companies coming up and you need to understand what they're doing, but probably the investment should be later stage when the company's uh, a little bit more mature as to what its product is. And, you know, you kind of have a path forward, but I'm happier. I don't know if Juan or Carolyn, you have a, uh, or Kirk, you have a view on that as to when corporate should invest as opposed to engage commercially. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of them, I don't know, I think it's, it's probably different over the years. You see more of these deals than probably anybody. Um, and I feel like there's probably more activity in the earlier stage now. Um, but there's a little bit of concerns if you get, you know, too early that, that like you said, that the fit might might not actually be there because some, oftentimes I think it's almost more the norm than the exception. The company's going in a slightly different direction than their original very, very first business plan. So. I think the, you know, the really early investment is, is, is a little bit tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Juan, I don't know if you have a view or Carolyn, if you have a view on that. It really depends on the corporate. Um, very few of them invest very early. That's actually unusual unless there's a highly aligned strategic reason, like this, this is the exact technology they're looking for for their exact whatever. Yeah. Um, they tend to want to be a little bit later, which is fine. One of the things that is an important part of what we do at Berkeley Skydeck is not just introdu introduce them for a possible investment, but to coach the both of them, the, this very young company and this very mature company on how to work together. Cause it really is, is you know, the mouse and the elephant trying to dance together. And, and it, if they're not careful, we know what happens to the mouse. <laughs> and not that the elephant does it on purpose, but it just, it just, it's very difficult for them. And so we do a lot of coaching about the, the time cycle it will take to get a corporate POC and then we'll coach the corporate on um, your expectations need to be um, very clear and open-ended in a way that maybe they're not with your larger uh, vendors or, or partners that you work with where you have very specific deliverable metrics on, at certain times. Um, and a, we, a lot can be done with a little bit of coaching on each side for a successful relationship. And I think one of the very important parts of that is an understanding, as you mentioned earlier, that the, one of the most valuable assets that startups have is time. And so there's, once again, another uh, Silicon Valley cliche called venture tourism, where the corporate mm. has invested, and then there's repeatedly groups from the corporate coming in, 
and talking with the company and soaking up its time. And so as a corporate, as, a, as the person who is engaging and responsible for the relationship, it's really important that you not over smother the startup with all of the uh, you know, people coming through. Show well, me you your AI startups. Which startups? Just your AI startups. Just show me all of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a couple. <laughs> I don't know if you have a thought on that. So I, I really like what, what Carolyn was saying. Um, absolutely. It's, it's you know, on from, from a corporate point of view, it's a risk to bring in a startup. Corporate innovation is, is a very difficult, very scary, very complicated thing where egos interact and yeah, it's just a very tough thing. So that's on the top. On the bottom, <clears throat> from an early stage startup and from an angel investor's point of view, we had a very interesting insight a few months ago, which is if you're an angel investor and you have your portfolio of companies, you're either helping them exit or you're collecting them. If you're not, if you're an angel investor and you're not actively helping to sell your companies, you're a startup collector, just like your Star Wars figures. You have your startups right there, all on a shelf because you're a very cool person and you want to impress your friends or you're trying to sell them. As in, CVCs are the aspiration of every single angel. So if we take the, if we take the relationship analogy again, how do you raise your children? It's a, you know, you gotta hug them, you gotta, you know, go to their games, go to their forums, you gotta go meet them. You gotta understand what is in their DNA so you can watch them grow and once they grow well then you integrate them so my advice would be cvcs you know send your people to every single angel group you have two things going for you number one you will be able to raise these these um companies these startups with your advice and number two you will have droves and droves of angels looking to bring you startups that fit. So relationship is what I would say. Yeah, let me make one uh, modest twist on that is, I would say go to angel forums that are run by organizations that have a proven record of success. Correct. Um, yeah, because I like Koretsu yeah, Forum. Of course. You know, uh, and band of angels and folks like that, because you know, in Silicon Valley, you could go to two angel groups every day, right, and see startups. But the quality of that startup differs pretty dramatically. So I think um, yeah. you know, there's only so much time that even corporates have. So I think it's very important that you go to venues that have curation, and whether that's an accelerator or whether that's read through forum or some other form, I think it's very important that you have the this curation because if you don't, I think uh, you mm -hmm. yeah, they have to be curated. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to go back to Carolyn on this question. You answered, you started out with one of those issues, but what are the two major concerns that startups have about CBC investors that are not, that are different from traditional financial investors? Uh, they really that concern I mentioned earlier is really the only one that's kind of regular. Um, the only other concern I think would be, and this is a concern about any investor is, um, does this look great on my cap table? You know, is this a very uh, high quality investor? Uh, there are a number of corporate venture capital groups that are investing in things that are completely new markets, mm -hmm. wildly new markets, right? We had a partner in today, uh, they make beer. They're looking at companies that are in digital health. Totally different market. So if you're a digital co health company, why do you want a beer company on your cap table? Um, so I think 
there's there's some perception that way but but in terms of what is the major concern they have it's mainly about um about ip um and i think that they they generally understand that having a, a corporate that is a fit for them is a is a huge boost uh, because it is so if, if you're a startup and you're in an industry and you have a major brand uh in that industry on your cap table that speaks volumes to other investors about um does the market want your product oh well the major company in in your market is on your cap table that looks like a good indication that it does. So Juan, do you have, do you have other concerns that uh, you've seen your startups have with corporates? Yeah, since we're, we're early stage, like I said, um, their major concern is where are the CVCs? <laughs> <laughs> we wanna talk to them, you know, how do we approach them? What do they need? What are they looking for? That's basically, you know, from, you know, $5 million in sales and below is what, what they want to do. They want to start meeting strategics. So is it, it's more like, can you provide introductions? So Kurt, do you have a, uh, any, any? Yes. Questions? So I think there's a very, very fine line between being synergistic and competitive. And so a lot of times, you know, companies might look at corporate VCs as having some synergies, but I know one concern certainly is if you get, you know, invested by one corporate VC, how are the other companies in the space, their competitors going to see you, you know, is it going to limit your action on exit options with all the other, uh, you know, corporations that are in that space. And so I know that's one concern that, I, that a lot of startups have is they want to take the money, but there's that, well, if you take it from company A, will that preclude company B from taking a serious look at us later and potentially acquiring us later? And I think that's probably one of the most common concerns that I see. And I think in certain industry that can be very realistic. I mean, there are, I think companies as we move into a more collaborative ecosystem driven world, corporations don't retain some of their old antagonisms, mm -hmm. but I think that's realistic. And one of the things that I think startups need to think about as well as CBC investors is, do you really need that board seat? Because if you take a board seat as a CBC, then you, you know, at least the potential is that you've marked them as kind of, you know, uh, somebody where you have a much closer relationship maybe than you do. But I think the, the critical issue is it may sort of warn off other people in the industry. So, Eric, do you have any thoughts on that, that, that question about the concerns of startups? CBC? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's two. You guys already touched on the primary one, which is conflicts. I think that's real um, in most industries. Um, but the second one, I also think I'll just highlight, uh, since we talked about the first one already, the second one really is um, just speed, right? Like the um, like startups can't spend three months fundraising from, you know, getting to an answer. Like, um, like what I caution a lot of um, founders to be wary of when engaging in corporate VCs is that they just um, take a little bit longer to get to a decision making process. So, you know, if, if you have, if you're raising money for 18 months, it takes six months just to get a decision, that's troublesome. So I think the speed uh, is something that's a real issue for a lot of startups. So being able to make decisions quickly. I mean, you, you ask all the, you know, founders are sort of our customers. And if you survey them, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Like the thing they, the founders really care about is responsiveness from their investors. So, yeah, and um, I think, yeah, I think I, go, I'm sorry, go ahead, complete your thought. No, so that's what I was going to say. I think I think structurally, speed is a, is an issue um, with corporate VCs that has to be addressed if they want to um, be more competitive in the deal flow. I think that's a, a very important uh, point, and I had an example of that actually, where we were representing a corporate actually from Germany, and we actually spent six weeks negotiating the term sheet, yeah, because mainly the in-house counsel weren't that familiar with venture. And essentially the um, startup said, we're done. If this is the way you treat us when we're dating, you know, when we're just getting to know one another, we can't imagine what it'll be like to have you on our cap table. So we're just not interested. So they walked away from the term sheet after six weeks of negotiation. So I think understanding the ecosystem and understanding the need for speed are critical. So we're coming to the end of our uh, our hour here, what I'd like to do is just get one more comment um, from each of the panelists. So Carolyn, can you start? 
one more comment about uh, corporate venture capital startups, yes. everything, yes. all of the above. Um, so corporate venture capital. So we're huge fans. Uh, some of the obvious reasons are they bring expertise. Um, they, they, they bring that, that industry pull. But I would say what I've seen that, I, that I'm really excited about is that they're starting to approach this not as a, uh, let's check a box, we did this, uh, let's get some returns, maybe we'll find some nice technologies, but they're approaching it as a cultural, a new cultural approach within their companies uh, of having a, an innovation mindset where they're coming with less of a, um, a checklist of outcomes and more of a, we're here to learn and grow and to get involved in this rich ecosystem here. And I think that's very beneficial for both sides. That's a great summary. Juan, would you like to give us your last comment? Uh, Juan, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I think um, my final comment um, is more in line with the with the age of innovation. Several years back, we were in these production wars and um, making more more efficiently with less waste. Well, uh, that is last century. At this point, production capability worldwide is pretty is pretty darn world class. So that's not the competition. Now you're seeing very big companies jumping over the fence. Google wants to make everything. Amazon wants to sell everything. Facebook wants to listen to and communicate everything. So the only, the only way that large corporations are going to exist in the next 20 years is by jumping on the innovation bandwagon. So if, if corporate culture waits and waits and waits, they will wait until Amazon takes over and Facebook takes over and Google takes over. And, that's, and that'll be it. So developing inroads into, into identifying critical innovation early on is the new capability and it's been so for the past maybe 20 years anybody that doesn't get on this is you know is is just gonna be bought by the bigger corporations is how i see it so act now great thanks Juan. eric do you have a thought yeah no i th i definitely i mean I, I think i'm a big fan of um corporate venture capital in startups i think they can be tremendously value add um, and so I think my, my only thing is I do think it, as we um, pointed out, it's very competitive. And so just like every uh, investor out there, I mean, it's all about the hustle. So like in, in a lot of these cases, um, you know, you see a lot of late stage, uh, very top tier venture funds. They will engage really early on with startups. Um, mm -hmm. And I think not necessarily to invest in again, I think it's just being helpful and being around the community. So I would encourage, um, corporate VCs to do the same, to get involved in the community early on, um, knowing that, you know, um, later stage is a better time to be investing. Um, but I think the the opportunity for corporate venture is super value add. I mean, I think um, being able to help navigate through a big company that's a potential customer, acquirer, channel partner, um, technology partner is very, very useful. And so I think like the, the insertion point has to be the right, it's got to be the right sort of inter interface. And I think, um, to me, that's just, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, I think CVCs have tremendous opportunity to be super helpful to startups um, as early as possible. Sure. I think, you know, traditionally, oftentimes when you're thinking, you know, big company, small company relationships, the tendency is to think big company is going to teach small company something. And I think, you know, the big companies, it's a great opportunity for reverse mentorship in a sense of where, you know, the big companies can really learn, you know, from the way of thinking and the mindset of, of some of these smaller companies and hopefully inspire their organizations to become a little bit more innovative. Thanks very much. Uh, you know, so I strongly agree with though many of those comments, but I guess the, the point I would make is, as Juan said, innovation has become, I think, absolutely critical. 
it's not optional anymore. It's something you need to do. And corporate venture is one way of doing it. As I indicated in my slides, it's one of the tools in what I call the innovation toolbox, but it's an important tool. And I think the last point I would make is one that I think Carolyn mentioned, which is really this is an ecosystem. And I think a number of the panelists have mentioned this and you need to understand the ecosystem. You know, the, I think the, where corporates can stumble early on is if they come into the ecosystem and because they're very well respected in their local jurisdiction, maybe it's Japan, maybe it's Germany, maybe it's even, I have one from Pittsburgh. Yeah, you know, the, the venture capital ecosystem is a mature ecosystem now. You need to understand it. You need to be willing to play by those rules uh, because if you don't, then you're gonna get left behind because, and you'll have reputational damage because it's a very, very competitive industry. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. We appreciate your attention. And um, I, you know, if, uh, if there's additional interest, I'm sure that um, Hal can put you in touch with the panelists. Thanks a lot, bye. Thank you very much, Mark thank and you. the panel. And I hope you'll all in, um, help me with a round of applause for the panel. Um, just very quickly, there was obviously a huge amount of information and insight shared um, through that hour, which um, obviously is available through recordings that we'll have on the app um, in the next uh, few days. Um, equally, I encourage you to keep in contact with each other um, through the app. Um, so if you need any help downloading it, ask one of the team. Um, I'd also like to thank our panel, and this goes throughout the day, um, acting as endorsers um, for quite a lot of our um, startups that are being featured today. We have various um, on looped presentation next door, and we fully expect more um, to come in over the next um, few weeks, which we shall keep you updated about. Um, you'll see on the program, Eric Wu was um, meant to be a member of that panel. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it due to um, late commitments, um, but we have pre-recorded um, a uh, set of questions with him. So again, please view that um, at your leisure. So once again, Thank you very, very much to our panel over in the US. Um, thank you for joining us late in the evening. Um, and we'll look forward to keeping in touch over the next few weeks. Thank you.